Hello, we will deal with uh, the poetry of Judith right now in this lecture. She is an Australian poet, so we will have a historical and a literary context to begin with, then look into the life of Judith Wright and then discuss two poems, Woman to Man, Eve to Her Daughters and finally, give our opinion on these two poems and the poet. Like America, like Canada, Australia was also discovered by Europeans in the 16th century. But then for settlement to take place in Australia, it took longer time. That is why the British settlement took place in Australia in 1788. That led to the native unsettlement. That means the indigenous people had to be unsettled. They had to go deeper and deeper into the forest. They had to lose their lands. As members of the Commonwealth, Canada and Australia participated in the First World War and the Second World War. And this Australian experience like Canadian experience is largely colonial and post colonial which has given rise to a literature called post colonial literature in Australia and many other parts of the world which were ruled by British people. As in the case of Canada, we have traditional poetry to start with in Australian poetry, romantic Victorian poetry in the beginning and then the waves of revolution came from Britain and America into Australia as it happened in the case of Canada. Poets in Australia as elsewhere began to think about environmental questions and also the status of women. That is why this environmental poetry and feminist poetry plus post-colonial poetry because of oppression all these things go together. The primary questions we have in post-colonial poetry or literature are relating to exploitation of the native people and alienation of both the native people and the settled people. We have well known Australian poets like Kenneth Slesser, Douglas Stewart, R. D. Fitzgerald, A. D. Hope, James Macaulay, Judith Wright, Kurt Walker who has another name. Udguru that is the tribal name, indigenous name. We have a very interesting case of a woman poet Gwen Harwood who had to publish her poems using men's name in 1961. She used two names we have here Walter Lehman and Francis Geyer. When she sent her poems to editors in Australia in the name of male, these poems were accepted. But when she sent her poems in her own name as a woman, they were rejected. That is why we have this example here. But remember in Germany in 1848, Louis Otto was able to publish her article in her own name. That is why this feminist question whether it is 19th century or 20th century or even today 21st century is very important for us. Feminist concern is very important for humanity. Judith Wright as we said is an Australian poet born in 1915 and she died in 2000. Her life is a remarkable life of dedication commitment to the land Australia. She is a notable Australian poet and an environmental activist. She was committed to the land and the native people throughout her life even just before her death she participated in a demonstration against atrocities on the native people. In her blood against the grain was ingrained. In her blood she was not for this white man's burden. She disbelieved this white man's burden that is going to another land and preaching Christianity converting them into Christians and then modernizing the land. She did not believe this. She became a voice for the oppressed voiceless people and also the voiceless land. She was opposed to war, technology and the destruction of nature. 
she defended the land, the people and also human values. Interestingly, she was influenced by poets like two contrasting minds like Blake and Eliot. Blake is a romantic poet, Eliot is a modernist poet. These two elements, opposite elements come together in the feminist thought of Judith Wright. She published a number of volumes, here we have mentioned some, The Moving Image, Woman to Man, The Gateway, The Two Fires, The Other Half, Alive, Phantom Dwelling. Some of the well known poems are Remittance Man, Woman to Man, Request to a Year, Eve to Her Daughters. We have chosen two poems, the first is Woman to Man. Again, for copyright reasons, we are not able to show the whole poem to you. Please go to the text or Poetry Foundation website. We will read some lines and summarize some others. Here we have the first stanza. The eyeless laborer in the night, the selfless, shapeless seed I hold, builds for its resurrection day, silent and swift and deep from sight foresees unimagined light that is the first stanza. The second stanza is about the nameless and faceless child which is the hunter and the chase as well as the third who lay between the couple. Here is a man and a woman and the woman has conceived a child and she is pregnant and so she is describing her own experience of expecting mother. Here we have summarized the third stanza. The third stanza shows that the child is the flesh and blood of the couple. Some third emerges from these two people. Let us read the fourth stanza now. This is a maker and the maid. This is the question and reply. The blind head butting at the dark. The blaze of light along the blade. Oh, hold me for I am afraid. The woman is really afraid. Every woman, every pregnant woman will have some kind of fear about the future, how she will live, how she will give birth to the child, how will she be able to take care of the child, some fear will always be there. That is why a woman always has a second birth after the child birth. Let us pay attention to the thematic contrast in this poem. We have a number of contrasts in this poem. It is amazing poem with full of contrast between woman and man, laborer and master, birth, life and love on the one hand and death on the other, light and dark, day and night, the hunter and the hunted, the maker and the maid, the question and the answer, pain and pleasure. This poem deals with the woman's perspective of childbearing. The fear and pain of giving birth to a child that is made up of the features of both parents is presented in this poem. A number of poetic devices are there in this poem. To begin with, we have repetition, the eyeless, the selfless, the shapeless. The word itself is not repeated, but the sound, the structure, less, 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 that is interesting, that draws our attention. Alliteration and assonance we have in the second line, the selfless, the shapeless, seed I hold. We have allusion to resurrection day the day of the child's birth referred to in the poem. It also has a reference to Christ's resurrection from his graveyard. Then we have alliteration, assonance and consonants in line number 4, silent and swift and deep from sight. Then we have anaphora which is remarkable in this poem. This is that is how the line begins and it is repeated in line 6, 9, 14, 16 and 17. That means, it gives a structural foundation for the whole poem. This is it. This is experience. This is life. This is love. This is death. This is the poem. We have a metaphor in line number 14. This is the blood's wild tree that grows. Blood's wild tree. Blood in the human body and that becomes wild tree that grows. Imagine a child growing in the womb of a mother. Then we have another metaphor in the intricate unfolded rose in line number 15. The whole paradox of this poem is 
summed up here this is a maker and the maid this is a question and reply what is that question what is that reply the poem is a question the poem is also a reply why does a woman alone have this child conception why does she alone experience a difficulty of giving birth to the child then we have alliteration consonants and assonance in line number 19 the blaze of light along the blade we have indicated all of them in different ways of highlighting b underlined l highlighted a put in bold blaze of light along the blade we have some rhyming system in this poem lines 1 4 and 5 in every stanza rhyme they have some rhyme scheme we have shown this in the example given here made line number 1 blade line number 4 and afraid line number 5 we have the rhythm of i am and also with some variations the meter of this poem is tetrameter there are eight syllables and so they make up four feet we have enjambment in only one case that is line number four then we have cesura and in stop lines for which we have this example here this is the maker and the maid this is a question and reply the blind head butting at the dark the blaze of light along the blade oh hold me for i am afraid let us see the overall impression we have for this poem the speaker of the poem is a pregnant woman who addresses her husband about the fears and pains she has about her conceiving and delivering the baby the child is nameless and faceless but it has the physical features of both parents the union of the woman and the man grows with nerves and veins like the tree and the rose it is a symbol of the challenges of the pregnant woman resurrection and the third who lay evoke the religious image of Christ's resurrection the speaker wants a man to hold her as she is afraid of the pains of the delivery which the man can never experience giving a feminist view of motherhood in this poem we move on to the next poem eve to her daughters this is much more open feminist we will see this it will be good if you can read the whole poem and then see how it is feministic on your own it is more like a dramatic monologue that is why the poem begins with something like a rebuttal something somebody has already said so it is a kind of reply so the speaker starts unfortunately we are not able to give the whole poem we have summarized in between as we have noted in blue color it was not I who began it turned out into drafty caves hungry so often having to work for our bread hearing the children whining I was nevertheless not unhappy where Adam went I was fairly contented to go this tells us about Eve's happy and submissive attitude at the beginning then let us see the next section I adapted myself to the punishment it was my life but Adam you know he kept on brooding over the insult over the trick they had played on us over the scolding he had discovered a flaw in himself and he had to make up for it Adam and Eve were created by God and asked to stay in this garden of Eden and there they met this problem of sin and they were expelled from the garden of Eden and that is why we have this punishment he was able to adapt herself to the punishment easily whereas Adam was not able to he was always thinking about the pleasures of the Eden garden so we have this they here is highlighted with the capital T that is why we have given this explanation they had played on us gods and devils angels Adam and Eve became playthings for gods their own competition and things like that here we have the contrast between Eve and Adam in their attitudes to the punishment given by God and also we have the difference between humans on the one hand and gods and angels and or devils on the other hand we have summarized these uh, sections 
we have just quoted three lines from here outside Eden the earth was imperfect there is a contrast between Eden being perfect and earth being imperfect. Earth is imperfect because of change of seasons man has to work hard and even this cooking by Eve was found to be bad by Adam. It was hard to compete with heaven says Eve everything is perfect in heaven that kind of competition with perfection is not possible on earth she realizes it but Adam could not be happy with whatever was available so he within brackets so he Adam said to work why did he start working to make a new Eden with all modern facilities gizmos investment education for children that is Abel and Cain it is a fantastic poem within a few lines connects the past biblical past genesis with our contemporary life today we have made all kinds of discoveries inventions for our own comforts air conditioners cars cell phones technology everything we have created artificial intelligence we have no end we keep on working we have no rest keep on working to make our life more and more comfortable to compete with the garden of eden to achieve perfection it is a beautiful poem let us see the next one you can see how his pride had been hurt some lines we omitted he was always mechanical minded he got to the very inside of the whole machine he started understanding how the machine works and then made more and more machines as for God and the other they cannot be demonstrated so what cannot be demonstrated does not exist it is a clear case of this limitation of patriarchal science science pursuit of knowledge for the sake of human beings we have another extract here Adam is jealous and egotist how to create a kind of perfect Eden in the earth he is the jealousy of Adam and he is egotist he is self centered he thinks about himself he does not bother about Eve or anything else but he was happier with the cave even if it is drafty cave I would suggest for the sake of the children that it is time you took over but you are my daughters you inherit my own faults of character even beyond existence faults of character have their own logic some more passage here with some summaries the story of Adam and Eve plus Abel and Cain demonstrates the faults of the submissive character of women as the speaker says then we have a passage perhaps nothing exists but our faults at least they can be demonstrated but it is useless to make such a suggestion to Adam he has turned himself into God who is faultless and does not exist the poem thus demonstrates the limitations of religious and scientific stories which women have to understand and help themselves it is a completely feministic poem rewriting the biblical story we have the thematic contrast between Adam and Eve work and rest crime and punishment praise and humiliation strength and flaw Eden and earth perfection and imperfection mechanical and original center and periphery God man and woman thematic trust is on the male story which is false according to the speaker and probably Judith Wright and many other women writers we have the rhetorical effect if the story of man is false do not believe it then the women have to free themselves that is why rhetorical effect of this poem is from the speaker to the daughters free yourself daughters free yourself from the falsehood of men there are quite a few poetic devices in this poem first we have this transferred epithet in drafty caves this discomfort is attributed to caves we have the case of light it is in I was nevertheless not unhappy the language itself is something different 
something quite contrasting in the whole informal context. We have alliteration in fleet footed that is fast moving, blazon we have list of convenience for human beings from refrigerator, cars, telephones, modern means of communication that is what the poet says in the poem that exactly is one alliteration modern means. Then we have anaphora and palace syndeton in repetition of and at the beginning of lines from 23 to 26. Then we have alliteration in mechanical minded in line number 30. We also have a very interesting antistrophe in this poem demonstrated at the end of lines 33, 34, 39 and 57. Science demonstrates, technology demonstrates, man patriarchy demonstrates, but that demonstration is all lie that is what the poet says. The rhyme in this poem is unmarked that means it is not very visible except for repetition of the pronoun it and the proper noun cane. Cane is repeated similarly it is repeated several times at the end of lines. The rhythm of this poem is common speech pattern and conversational tone. It is non-metrical that is free verse. The poetic form is free verse and specifically the form of the poem is dramatic monologue. The speaker speaks to her daughters, there is a context, there is a listener, there is a purpose. The mode of the poem is logical argument and it is also a kind of persuasion of Eve's daughters not to believe in men and pursue their own experiences, dreams and desires. We have the overall impression here. Wright's poem is an address to women from the perspective of Eve to her daughters. It takes the shape of a dramatic monologue with the implied listener. The whole poem is an argument and also a narrative of rewriting the biblical story of Adam and Eve. We have to remember that rewriting, revisioning is an agenda of feminist poets. The story is continued right up to the present age of mechanization and man's effort to play God. Hence, the poet demystifies or deconstructs the creation myth and reveals that God does not exist and so man who attempts to become God does not exist. It is a wonderful argument. The world belongs to women that is Eve's daughters. The open form of the poem opens up the world to women casually, informally, but logically and powerfully. We have the map of Australia here for one specific reason. Great Barrier Reef is a natural resource in Australia. Judith Wright spent her lifetime to protect this Great Barrier Reef in her country. This is an environmental concern which held the heart of Judith Wright throughout her life. This is only one example. She was interested in protecting the whole Australian land. Let us see a summary now. We presented a historical and literary context for understanding the Australian poet Judith Wright. It is an Australian context, so we have to understand the colonial and post-colonial literary, political, cultural traditions of the poet. She was interested in the land, in the people, in the language of the people and nature particularly. So, she devoted herself to write about the land and the people. We have two poems for discussion in this lecture. One is woman to man and the next is Eve to her daughters. Woman to man talks about the relationship between the two and Eve to her daughters again talks about particularly the politics, the power behind the relationship between the two. The second poem is much more openly feministic. It draws our attention to the misconceptions we have about the biblical stories and so the poet wants us to free the women from such misconceived notions. The analysis of the poems reveals that Judith Wright 
is an excellent poet both thematically and technically. We have some references for you. Thank you.